Hello and welcome to the New World Review, your source for everything anime and manga, so long as that anime and or manga has the word hunter in its title, preferably twice. And more specifically, welcome to the Nencyclopedia, where today it is time to examine the sheer insanity that is Karapika. So welcome to Karapika, a man who has dedicated his life to a singular purpose of retrieving the dismembered scarlet eyes of his deceased clan members. Very serious, incredibly driven, and I would argue one of the most intelligent characters in Hunter x Hunter. Possibly even the most intelligent, if if you remove Meruem from the equation, which if I have my maths correct, Hunter Hunter minus Meruem divided by Karapika equals subscribe to the New World Review for regular Hunt Hunter content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. There it is, it's mathematically proven that you should click that red button. Don't go ignoring facts now and let me know if you're a new subscriber in the comments and welcome to the association. But Karapika is quite a tough character when it comes to the world of Nen, primarily because most characters tend to develop a core competency in one or two specific Hatsu and then innovate and reapply it as need be like Hisoka, for example, one of the most feared Nen users in the series, and he really only has two abilities to his name. Karapika is very much the opposite. He revels in complexity and uses Nen in a way that very few people in this world could ever hope to. However, when it comes to Nen, it should be stated that Karapika does not possess the ridiculous natural talent of say a Gon or a Killua, nor does he have the advantage of their natural physicality, like Killua having been trained as a hardcore assassin and Gon just starting the series with superhuman abilities for um, reasons. Comparatively, Karapika is less talented talented and more frail. However, as it turns out in the world of Nen, those two things are meaningless compared to another factor, that being drive and desire. Gon and Killua could run rings around Karapika in terms of raw talent. However, they don't even come close to equalizing his laser-like focus on the desire to avenge his people. And combined with his unparalleled analytical mind, Karapika is undoubtedly a far more proficient Nen user than either Gon or Killua. And this has been quite clearly shown to us at every step of the way, as Karapika had crafted not just one, but an entire series of Nen abilities by the events of York New City, whereas Gon and Killua were still very much testing out the basics. And in addition to this, Karapika also had access to the more advanced applications like Shu well before the others did. But the other absolutely key advantage that Karapika has in the Nen world, before we even get into his abilities, is a master level knowledge of Nen theory. In a world that emphasizes how unpredictable Nen combat is, Karapika is able to navigate any situations like he's able to see through the matrix or something. And more so than any of his actual abilities, this is what makes Karapika a true force to be reckoned with, allowing him to perform feats like completely clowning the entire Phantom Troop during York New City, or perhaps even more impressively, become an active participant in the Succession War currently taking place on the Black Whale One. And with all of that in mind, let's now identify Karapika's affinity as a conjurer, a category that fits him pretty perfectly, allowing Karapika to sculpt his aura into physical objects. And conjuration, unlike many other affinities, requires a certain level of strategic ability to use properly. Otherwise, you just end up with characters like, you know, Cheetu. However, under control of the right people, conjuration is shockingly powerful and spoiler alert, Karapika is indeed the right people. That's not where his affinity ends though, because currently Karapika is the only known character in the world who has access to a second natural affinity being specialization. And the theory behind this is that when Karapika activates his scarlet eyes, it moves him one step to the left on the Nen ring. And look, there's no scientific explanation for why this is. And if I had to guess, I'd say it's because when Karapika activates his scarlet eyes, it's generally under extremely serious and driven conditions, thus very much prompting his Nen to respond in kind. Because that's how Nen works, emotions always trump science. Whatever the case, I really want to emphasize that specialization is the key to quite literally everything in regards to Karapika's Nen abilities. If he was restricted to being a natural conjurer, then his path in the series would look very different and very underwhelming. And to explain why this is, we first need to take a look at his crowning Hatsu known as Emperor Time. This is the first of two specialist abilities that Karapika has crafted and by far the most important. And very, very basically what this allows Karapika to do is to use abilities generated by each Nen affinity at 100% effectiveness. It's an important word, effectiveness. And I know that probably doesn't make a lot of sense right now and sounds very vague, but stick with me because to dive into this, we need to introduce the concept of Nen levels, yay. And levels are also quite vague in nature, but they are used to indicate an individual's mastery of a certain Nen affinity, as well as accurately gauge what their levels for the other affinities would be. So a very basic example, if Karapika is a level 10 Chondra, then that means his maximum mastery of transmutation, his neighboring affinity, would be level eight. Meanwhile, his maximum mastery would say emission would be a level four because that is directly opposite conjuration on the Nen ring. It does get more complicated though because levels do not tell the full story behind Nen. Taking the system as we know it, it would imply that Karapika would be roughly on par with a natural level four emitter. However, the natural emitter will always be more powerful in this situation. And this is because not only would a conjurer be restricted to level four mastery, but every drop of aura put into an emissive ability would 
only be 40% potent, whereas say Aura spent on a Conjuration ability would be 100% potent, meaning that the sunk cost for engaging in an emissive technique is 60% of the overall Aura spent, which is generally why it's a terrible idea to use the opposite affinity on the Nen Ring. But most importantly, this means that a level four natural emitter will be producing an ability at 100%, whilst Karapika using level four emission as a Conjurer will only be able to produce an ability at 40%. And in case you're not following, 100% is a much larger quantity than 40%. And what Emperor Time does, which gets greatly, greatly confused by the fan base, is it makes up the gap at this stage here. It allows Karapika to negate the aura cost of engaging in other affinities, meaning that whilst it is active, he could now equally match the level four emitter or a level six enhancer or a level eight transmuter or a level six manipulator, I guess, which is a much more underwhelming ability than most people think. However, what it does is it makes all Nen affinities very viable options. Whereas a standard natural conjurer would almost never see emission as viable due to the extraordinarily high cost for the minimal output. So in effect, Emperor Time gives Karapika a Swiss army knife of Nen options to work with whilst it is active. Like most things Nen related though, this potent power comes at a potent cost and every second spent using Emperor Time will reduce Karapika's lifespan by one hour, which can obviously be very, very bad, perhaps even fatal, because if he uses Emperor Time for too long, then this strain causes Karapika to black out. That limit is about three hours and at that point in the manga, Karapika passed out for a further nine hours whilst Emperor Time was still active. And as such, this accidental 12 hour period cost Karapika five years of his lifespan overall. So it's very high risk and quite problematic because Karapika's further abilities are heavily reliant on Emperor Time's activation. Now Karapika's other hearts who have their roots in conjuration as he elected to conjure a series of chains, five in total, each one assigned to a particular digit on his hand. The first of which is known as the dowsing chain. And it's a rather simple ball and chain often used for combative and defensive purposes. However, it can also perform some other utility actions and has been used in the past to determine the location of missing individuals. And it can also act as a lie detector. And furthermore, with Emperor Time activated, it can even be used as a lie detector through video footage. And look, this is another one of those things that definitely doesn't make too much scientific sense, if any, but it's based on the idea of dowsing divination. So Karapika has preloaded this ability with those ideas. And I'd like to point out at this stage that just dowsing chain would be a crazy enough Nen ability for any one character to have, but we still have five more to go through with Karapika. And the next one is going to be Holy Chain. And this is a combination of conjuration and enhancement. Quite specifically, we have Karapika using enhancement to heal his injuries, which he can do rather easily with Emperor Time active. And for example, in the series, he was seen healing a fractured arm within mere seconds, which is pretty wild. But once again, Emperor Time is the key to this. Without it active, Karapika's capabilities would be significantly lessened to the point of potential uselessness, actually, unless he was healing like a paper cut or something. But next up, we have Judgment Chain, which presents Karapika's most complex Hatsu being formed by conjuration, emission, and manipulation. The latter two affinities being a very weak area for a Contra, and as such, this ability can only be used with Emperor Time active. But it's pretty ridiculous because basically Karapika is able to send a blade and chain into a victim's body, wrapping it around their heart, and then Karapika is able to issue the victim with a command, which if violated will result in the instant death of said victim. A good example of which would be when he ordered Uvagin to tell him where the rest of the Phantom Troop were. Uvagin refused, and then Judgment Chain promptly killed him. This isn't the only way Judgment Chain can be applied though, because weirdly enough, Karapika has also used this ability on himself. And why you ask? Well, it's to set a limitation on another ability. And that Hatsu would be Chain Jail, a very simple pure conjuration existence that is designed to wrap a target in unbreakable chains, as well as enforce a state of Zetsu in Aura users. And when I say unbreakable chains, that's actually impossible to create, but Karapika does get pretty damn close. And it's all because he performed the aforementioned Judgment Chain ability on himself to set a condition that if he ever used Chain Jail against someone who was not a member of the Phantom Troop, then Judgment Chain would kill him instantly. And in this weird, fancy, and surprisingly mathematical world of Nen, this restriction actually resulted in Chain Jail receiving a significant power boost. And it is confirmed to be capable of restraining any member of the Phantom Troop unfortunate enough to be ensnared in it. All I can really say though is that Karapika better be pretty damn sure that his target is a member of the troop, otherwise using Chain Jail, oh, that's not going to end well for him. And just to dispel a common misconception, Chain Jail is actually the only ability that has this limitation put on it. There's a common thought throughout the Hunt Hunter fan base that all of Karapika's abilities are only able to be used against the Phantom Troop, but that is so far from true. It's just Chain Jail that gets affected by this, and every other ability we've examined, as well as every other ability we will examine, is fair game for anyone. So let's keep going now with Steel Chain, which is steel as in S-T-E-A-L, like a thief rather than the metal substancey thing. And this is yet another ability in the series that 
takes the abilities of others, making Krampika sort of a mini Krollo. It essentially consists of Krampika inserting a syringe on the end of a chain into a victim and temporarily acquiring one of their abilities, which also has the insane effect of draining the target of aura, leaving them in a state similar to that of Zetsu. And this Hatsu can be somewhat confusing because the two best known ability thieves in the series being Krollo and Leol are both specialists and Krampika did not, I repeat, did not have his Scarlet Eyes active when using Steel Chain, meaning that he can use this as a natural conjurer. Although I will say that the Scarlet Eyes appear to have been invoked shortly after the ability, but not during. And I'll also say that there is precedent for basic affinities being able to steal Nen abilities and Shikaku comes to mind. This man is a natural manipulator and thus unable to access specialization at all. And yet he was able to craft a Hatsu known as Cold Sept, which theoretically allowed him to take the ability of someone else and contain it within like this Nen Cardi thing. With that said, I can't quite explain the technicalities of how Krapika can perform Steel Chain. And what's even more wild is that Krapika does not lose access to the stolen ability if the original user dies, which is one of Krollo's hugest restrictions. It's also unclear as to whether or not Krapika needs to fulfill various conditions like Krollo and Leol had to. Everything in the manga just happened so quickly, but I can't imagine that Krapika can do this without a ton of conditions to meet. One of which may be the following sub ability, which is called Stealth Dolphin, very adorable sounding. And this ability does require Emperor Time to be activated because it is pure specialization. And what it does is allow Krapika to analyze and equip stolen abilities, which is an important distinction from just stealing them. I think the implication here is that Steel Chain can take abilities. However, Krapika cannot use them without invoking Stealth Dolphin. And at this point, I should also say that this ability, the stolen ability is fueled by the aura that was drained from the target, which is once again, pure insanity, because even without the ability stealing aspect, the fact that this Hatsu can just drain a target of their aura is a guaranteed win condition against any Nen user should it connect. That's not it though, because Krapika can use Stealth Dolphin in conjunction with Steel Chain to loan the stolen ability to another person. And given that it runs off stolen aura, that person doesn't even have to be a Nen user. Although as a side effect, it will force their aura nodes open and it will turn them into one, thus initiating them to Nen, which is the uh, frowned upon method of awakening. Thankfully, there are a couple of negatives with this combination, one of which is that the stolen ability can only be used once, whether that be by Karapika or someone else, after which point it gets returned. Very similar to Leo's rental pod actually. And while the ability is in use, Stealth Dolphin will enforce Emperor Time, meaning that Karapika is unable to voluntarily deactivate it, which can be very problematic when someone else has control of the stolen ability. In fact, that's how Karapika ended up passing out and losing five years of his life. So as crazy as all of this sounds, I suppose it did come at a pretty grand cost. Still, if Karapika was careful, then Steel Chain pretty much immediately becomes one of the most overpowered abilities in all of Hunter Hunter, even more so than Judgment Chain in my opinion. It's fairly maddening though, because any one of Krapika's abilities would be incredible for any Nen user to possess, let alone all six core abilities, most of which also have sub functions attached to them as well. The trade-off being, of course, that to use any of them to their needed level, it generally requires a direct exchange of life. So you could consider Krapika's Nen mastery as the opposite theory of the more established users in the world. For example, people like Netro and Zeno got where they are today by investing the time into their study and practice with great patience. And only now in their old age can they wield such extraordinary power. Meanwhile, Krapika has gone down the opposite road, choosing to wield extraordinary power at a young age in exchange for, I suppose, never making it to old age. So he is a brightly burning Nen candle fueled by vengeance and who knows how much of his life he's already exchanged to get this far. Krapika may very well have lost entire decades of his life at this point, which makes every needed use of Nen that much more dangerous to invoke. But that is the price that Krapika is willing to pay and it has made him one of the most formidable Nen users in the entire series. But what do you guys think? Please do leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you're keen for some more Hunt Hunter content, then please do go and check out some of my other videos or even subscribe to the channel for regular Hunt Hunter glory delivered straight into your YouTube feed. But for now, this has been the New World Review and I'll see you next time.